Now, at the age of 11 months, I was diagnosed with an incurable cancer of the central nervous system called neuroblastoma stage 4. Uh, they said that there was no chance of survival. Uh, we had a 96% uh, death rate, was told to go home. But like all of us, <clears throat> we have choices, and the choices that we make can reshape and remould and redefine our future. And, and my mum asked one question. I don't want to know what the chances are of my son dying. I just want to know what the chances are of my son surviving. So she, she grabbed hold of the 4%. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome back. If we haven't met before, great to meet you. My name is Aaron. We tap into the stories of some of the world's most successful people, and not just successful people, ordinary people too, to understand what made them who they are and how they are collectively making our world a better place. If you're looking for dopamine, inspiration, new knowledge, or actions that you can take today to become a better future self, you have come to the right place. To learn more about us, you can head over to our website, www.transformativepurpose.com. And please don't forget to follow, rate, and share if you enjoy our content. Everything you see here is run by myself and a small team, and we'll really appreciate it. And last but not least, our mission is to build a global community to inspire. Enjoy. And today, I am going to take your mind on a trip and speak to an incredible person who is based in Australia, a place where I have spent a lot of time in. I've watched all his videos. Listening to him speak each time has always brought a tear to my eyes and a smile in my heart. My guest today is Michael Crossland. Michael has inspired more than 600,000 people globally. He has spoken with the likes of Richard Branson, Dalai Lama, and Tony Robbins. He had it tough as a child and as a dad, I'll let Michael share his remarkable stories and how he found meaning from extreme adversity to motivate him to become a better person in order to achieve personal and professional outcomes. He represented Australia to play a sport that he loves, held an executive position with one of the largest companies in the world at the age of 23, and then threw it all away to find his true passion and purpose. Today, we're going to cover what can we do when faced with extreme adversities? What are the keys to success? We often hear about glass half full, but how do we actually do it? How do we change our mindset to embrace change? And how does someone live a happy life? Welcome to the show, Mike. My pleasure. Thank you so much for the introduction. You've, you've pumped the tires up, so hopefully I can uh, live up to the expectation you have set. Look, um, I, mean, I, I meant it. I listened to your videos again and again, and each time I, I watch it, uh, it just moved my heart. And a few people have had huge impacts on my life. Some of them I've met, and some of them I have not met, and you are one of them. <laughs> That's very kind, mate. I, I can't believe that, uh, you know, I, I'm just an ordinary, humble Aussie that, uh, that's faced my fair share of kicks and challenges. And for one of the videos now to go viral, it's um, it hit 82 million views a couple of weeks ago. I just, I can't believe it's, um, you know, being able to have such a, such a big reach. So, um, you know, grateful to be on your show and, and really looking forward to delving deep and being able to try and add value to people all around the world in the challenges that they face in and maybe sharing a few tools and tips to be able to assist in some, some challenges. Thank you, looking forward to our chat. Hey, you have an incredible story to tell. Do share with us what made you who you are today, what was it like growing up as a child and how did you persevere? I think without a doubt, the, the man I am today is because of the mother that I had as a little boy. Uh, for somebody who never gave up on her son despite what the world what the medical doctors uh, were saying is um, for me such a such a, a blessing and a privilege and an honor to to call her my my hope my inspiration um, my my rock um, you know, at the age of 11 months I was diagnosed with an incurable cancer of the central nervous system called neuroblastoma stage 4 uh, they said that there was no chance of survival uh, we had an, a 96% death rate was told to go home but like all of us, <clears throat> we have choices and the choices that we make can reshape and remould and redefine our future. And, and my mum asked one question, I don't want to know what the chances are of my son dying, I just want to know what the chances are of my son surviving. So she, she grabbed hold of the 4% as opposed to looking at the glass being 96% empty. And um, to this day, I'm you know, obviously eternally grateful. I had many, many years of chemotherapy. Unfortunately, the chemotherapy didn't do the job. Um, I was a part of an experimental drug in 1988. They trialled on 
25 patients around the world and unfortunately within one day of this drug that we started on um, we were all transferred from the oncology ward to the burns unit uh, we were we were covered from head to toe in blisters and um, then uh, within one month 20 out of 25 of us had, had died from that drug and then within three months uh, everyone besides myself had had passed away so I, I, I share this story with you all today and I share it saying to people that I'm one of the lucky ones but I, I never say I'm one of the lucky ones because I'm still alive, I say I'm one of the lucky ones because I wasn't my mum. You know, as you'll hear throughout today's chat, um, you know, I, I've recently discovered that it is far easier lying in the bed than standing next to it. And, uh, you know, I, I'm so grateful that she made those tough decisions to continually burn her son. She, she had to go to death counseling once a week to deal with what was going to happen to a little boy. And I can't imagine that type of pain. So, you know, it, it, was a, it was a real battle growing up. Obviously, I spent you know, five, nearly five and a half years of my upbringing in hospital. Um, I was told I'd never go to school. I'd never play sport. I'd be a housebound baby. And if I reached my teenage years, it'd be a miracle. But... My mum always had this underlying saying that everything will be okay, son, everything will be okay. And, you know, I, I started playing a game that I loved and that was baseball and they told me to not play that because my heart was too negatively impacted by the drugs. And uh, then at the age of 12, I had my first heart attack, which, which really put me on the back burner because I, I really started to feel like a normal kid for the first time I started playing sport I started making friends and and it was uh, it was a really good place and then all of a sudden that got stripped away and they said that I'd never be able to play sport again because of what had occurred and the damage that had happened but um, you know I, I realized as a very young boy no one is ever going to tell you what you can do they'll only ever tell you what you can't and it's our choice whether we choose to listen and I made the choice to believe in myself and and um, you know, within two years, I'd, I'd made the Australian under-16 baseball team or flew to America. I got a chance to play baseball over there for, for a little while. I, I signed a scholarship when I was 17 to go to college. And, you know, it was, it was a remarkable journey. Um, but as you all know, life is very much like a roller coaster. We can get to a pinnacle point in our life and it can get taken away from us in a heartbeat. And, and for me, it did. I was only over there for six months before I slid into a base and I uh, woke up three days later my heart couldn't compete my health had rapidly deteriorated financially we couldn't afford to be there and I was sent back home back to Australia and uh, you know I was obviously I was disappointed um, but I, I never had a plan B Aaron and I think that's really important I think a lot of people have a plan B and they dive into plan B before they give everything a plan A and I wanted to be a guy that did everything I could to achieve plan A and when I failed at plan A I come up with another plan A and as you know I got into banking I, I worked my way up into a, a senior executive role very very quickly by the time I was 23 I had 600 staff at 120 banks around Australia and New Zealand I reported directly to the CEO and you know I I created what I thought was success but I realized when I got there I was so far away from it right I I had the multi-million dollar house and the hundred thousand dollar sports car and the Armani suits and but the one thing that I was missing um, was was happiness. I was so far away from being happy, and uh, it took me until 2010 when I, I got bacterial meningitis. I got fluid on the brain. I had Bell's palsy. I had to learn to walk again and talk again. I know you know all about that. And yeah. I, uh, I have about two episodes of Bell's palsy yeah, in my life. <laughs> I, I I was battling. I was I was wow. battling not only physically, but more importantly, I was I was battling emotionally, and I was probably as depressed and as flat as I'd ever been in my life. And I, I got to a point where I didn't want to fight anymore. And and uh, I was I was in hospital, and and my wife would come in, and she would hug me and kiss me every night, and she would say I love you. And I would wait for her to leave the room, and I would say I love you and goodbye, because every night I'd pray to God that I wouldn't wake up. Uh, I'd had enough. But in those dark times. Um, we realized that there's only one way to go. And as you know, from there, I decided uh, over the last decade to commit my life to serving and giving back. So I walked away from the corporate world. I, I got into speaking. I, um, 
I started to get into the humanitarian world. I, I started to give back to other people. And, you know, the, the greatest saying that I live my life by is we must give without remembering and we must receive without forgetting. And that's when I, uh, I, well, I aligned myself with a whole heap of charities. And then I realized that people were donating 50 or 60 bucks to provide drinking water to a boy or girl in Africa. And 95% of that was getting chewed up in administration costs and a couple of bucks was going to the kids. So we started our own charity called Frontier Projects um, where every cent gets sent. And uh, we were told that we'd never be able to have kids so I decided to, uh, to, to go out there and still be able to be a dad. So my wife and I, we opened up an orphanage for 44 beautiful little kids in a re remote little village um, in Haiti after the earthquake hit in 2010 and killed 316,000 people. And, um, and we also opened a school. Uh, we opened a school in, in 2012. We got 270 kids that go there. and. Uh, you know, it's been it's been an amazing roller coaster these last few years. I've, I've written a couple of books. They're now bestsellers. We donate all the profits to charity. Uh, 2016, my world uh, come crashing back down again in a hurry. Uh, I, I got very unwell again. They they found four more tumors in my throat. And they told me that I um, I probably wasn't going to make Christmas. But I remember that saying that my mum taught me as a little boy: everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. And, they, uh, they removed the f three out of the four tumors. The fourth tumor is wrapped around my vocal cord. But, you know, one thing that I've realized in my life is that the quality of one's life is not dictated, nor is it determined by the amount of days we live on this earth. It's about what we fit into those days that allows us to live a remarkable life. And I, I really want to make sure that regardless of the challenges that this life throws at me, I want to give everything I can to not just leave a legacy but Aaron I, I really want to live into my legacy so that uh, that that in a nutshell is the snapshot of my my 36 years on this uh, on this amazing planet that we all are privileged to uh, to call home wow you, you you've covered a lot of stories even stories that <laughs> I, I I didn't know uh, from doing my, my, my research and just hearing all your personal stories and challenges and the ups and downs just made me realize how insignificant uh, my personal suffering is compared to yours. Um, you mentioned 96% survival rate, 4%, uh, sorry, 96% of death rate and 4% of survival rate. That news was told to your mother when you were at a very young age. What? And obviously, I think your mother is a, is a role model to you and had a huge impact to your life and your values and who you are today. What kept your mother going at that time? I, I just can't Im imagine the pain that she had to go through as a mother, you know, going through all the death counseling and not knowing the, uh, the future of, um, of her loved one. Yeah, I think that um, in the world that we live in, when we replace our fear with our faith, it's remarkable the baggage that can be lifted off us. And... You know, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a strong, faithful man. I believe in God, and and I know my mum has certainly had that uh, that relationship too. So, with without a doubt, the the one thing that kept her going was the the relationship and the faith that she had uh, that everything was going to be okay. But secondly, as many people that are listening know, like when we're in the trenches, regardless of the depth, you know, you you spoke before about. Um, comp compare or comparing my challenges to yours or or others you know I love that saying I cry when I didn't get a new pair of shoes until I saw a boy that had no feet so often when we compare our adversities and our challenges to other people we quickly begin to realize how lucky uh, you know how lucky we are to have what we have but the thing is is that my adversity could be incredibly deep and dark and somebody else's adversity could be very light and shallow you know, some people think that the worst thing that could ever happen to them is getting stuck in traffic on their way to an important meeting and that their life's not fair. But, you know, if that's the depth of their darkness, then their pain is worse than mine because one thing that I've discovered over many years of research and living my life and going through the ups and downs and the highs and the lows is that <clears throat> our pain and suffering is not so different. What is so different is our solutions. If the depth of my darkness is at a certain level. However, I do have the tools, I have the mindset, and I have the passion to get out of that hole, then my darkness is nowhere near as bad as yours. 
So I guess it's not so much about the comparing of one's pain to another, but rather what tools are in your toolbox that will assist you in getting through. So to answer your question, you know, for me, I think it was really about the faith that my mum had and, um, and the unwavering commitment and dedication to not giving up on her child. And I'm sure that if anybody who's listening walks a day or a month or a year or five or six years in my mum's shoes, they would do exactly the same. As you know, as a father, you would give your right arm. If, if your heart was a match to your child, you would give up your heart, take your life to be able to provide for your kid. And that's, that's exactly what she did. And that's just the unwavering miracle of love that we have for a child. Mm. I, I know some, something happened to your child. And I just wanted to ask you if there's one thing that you've ever wanted more than anything in the world, what was it? Or what is it? Yeah, I, um, I, you probably just let the cat out of the bag a little bit. But um, so I, I was told that I'd never be able to have kids. And um, that, was, that was my dream of one day being able to be a dad, I think. To be a parent is the greatest gift that God can bestow on any of us. Um, but that was the one thing they said we could never do. But in 2017, we were lucky enough to announce to the world that um, my wife, after many, many years of IVF, was pregnant. Um, it went on 166 news channels around the world. We were just inundated with love and excitement. and um, So we were due to have a baby the end of February 2018. But on the 8th of December 2017, my wife had a lot of back pain. We went into hospital and uh, she was two centimetres dilated. We were airlifted to Sydney Hospital and four days later, she gave birth to a beautiful little baby boy named Lachlan James. He was uh, 29 and a half weeks, uh, 11, nearly 11 weeks early, and uh, he weighed just on two pound. And he was he was doing it really tough. And um, then they told us that he had a horrible illness called sepsis. And they said that if he made it to the end of the week, that it would be a miracle. And I think for the first time in my life, I walked a day in my mum's shoes. And as I said earlier, it's far easier to lie in the bed than stand next to it. And I remember watching a man resuscitate my little boy. And I, I just started yelling to the sky, take, take my house take my car, take my career, take everything that I've ever achieved in my life, but please don't take my little boy. And I think that for all of us, we so often wait to be in a place of extreme darkness before we begin to appreciate the little things that we once took for granted. And I challenge everyone that's listening today to, to not wait until it's too late before you decide to change, to not wait until you're diagnosed with lung cancer before you think maybe I should stop smoking. Don't, don't wait until you lose someone that you love before you make the effort to tell them that you love them. Now, I always love the challenge. I want to challenge everybody listening. I just want you to text somebody and say, hey, I care about you. I love you. Thanks for being a great friend. And I, I guarantee you, I know what they'll write back. They'll write back two words and a question mark. They'll write back, what's wrong? You know, we, we don't tell people what they mean to us. They'll, they'll think you're you're dying, they'll think you've lost your job, they'll think you're drunk. You know, we, we don't tell people how much they mean to us and, until it's too late. And, um, you know, he battled. He battled for many, many months. And then one day we captured his first little smile and I knew that day was the day that I truly believed in my heart that everything was going to be okay. And now to have a healthy little three-and-a-half-year-old boy who just... I'm glad to hear that. Eats like a machine and craps. Like I've never seen a human being crap as much as this thing craps. It is unbelievable. But you know, we we love him more than we could ever imagine. And I never realized that you had so much more in your heart to give. And then a child enters your world and your heart doubles. And then in January this year to make our family complete. Uh, my wife and I gave birth to a gorgeous little girl named Summer Grace. And I thought how, yeah, thank you. I thought how could, 
How can my heart feel the same amount of love for someone else as it does for my little boy? And then all of a sudden you realize that your heart is bigger than you could ever imagine. And I think that, you know, from a psychological point of view, from a commitment point of view, from a determination point of view, from optimism and resilience and courage, we have so much more in us than we could ever begin to imagine. It's just about having the faith and having the belief to tap into it and and be able to share it and be able to impact others and be able to serve others and to be able to realize that everything is going to be okay. We just need to keep the faith and keep the commitment and keep the determination and, and keep the humility and the kindness in the world. And I think, you know, that they're just such important traits for us to all harness on a day-to-day basis. Mm. I, I remember my, my parents used to tell me, you know, uh, Aaron, you'll, you'll know the, the purpose of, of parenting once you've become a father you understand the the challenges and the rewards once you've become a father and we often hear that um, having a child is our second chance of living right to really understand what love is what what has all of those taught you about love what has having a child taught me about love yep oh man i understand what it feels like now (laughs) <laughs> you know, I, I've, I, I have a beautiful wife and I, I love her more than anything in the world, but it is, it is a completely different love than the love for a child. And as I said to you earlier, you know, if, if the doctor came to me and said, my, you know, Mike, your, your son, he needs a new heart, you know, I, I would, that'd be it. I, I, and, and, and there's some way in the world that they could use mine, <laughs> then my time on this earth would come to a very abrupt end to do anything to save that little boy's life. You know, I was saying to someone the other day on TV that if only I had been a parent at the age of like 13 or 14, just just for the day, <laughs> just, just so I could experience the unbelievable, unwavering, suffocating, emotional love that you have for your child, how much of a better son would I have been as yep. a teenager, you know? And you appreciate your parents a lot more. Oh my God. That was, <laughs> you know, I was a good kid, but there were times that I was a little rat bag, a yep. little dirt bag. And I just think, oh my God, if I knew then what I knew now about that fear and the protection and the love and the commitment oh my god and it the worries been, yeah, the yeah, the worry, yeah all of those things i said to a mate of mine the other day i was like man i just can't wait till i get a bit older so that i don't have to worry so much and he's like hey of a night time where's your kids i was like yeah they're like right next to me in the room in, in like the bedrooms down the hallway and he's like my daughter's 17 of the night time I go to bed, I have no idea where she is. I was she like, is. oh my God, <laughs> you can have that. You can have that. So yeah, it's, a, it's crazy. But yeah, that, that's that's how I feel about that, you know, the, the love as a parent. It's, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, you, you've come a long way. All the obstacles and challenges that you shared. I have my fair share of uh, adversities, like I, I briefly mentioned in the introduction. And the I had, I had a similar um, viral infection as you, um, Bell's palsy. Uh, I had it twice in my life. First time was at the age of 19 uh, when I was cramming for the finals um, at one of my best friend's house. And at 2 or 3 a.m., I just went to the bathroom and I realized I couldn't move half of my face. And, uh, you know, for the next three months, I, I couldn't smile. I couldn't blink. I couldn't eat properly. I couldn't speak at a company. And what you just said really resonates with, uh, with me, right? Is for many people, like myself, I think included, is the sudden loss of the basic things that we have in life. Maybe realize, you know, what are, you know, the, the usual things that we, each and every day, we take it for granted. And that wasn't my first time of having Bell's palsy. I had Bell's palsy again at the age of 32. And the recovery even took longer. This time it took four months. But I, again, I lost all the basic things I've uh, taken for granted. And about your point about you know being a being a first time father, I I never appreciated I I think that the the, the challenging roles and responsibilities of being a parent. Uh, the day before my, uh, my my newborn turned three months old, he suffocated for about five minutes. Right, I was holding him, you know, trying to get his stuff out from his mouth. He was frothing up, his, all these bubbles coming out. 
uh, from his mouth and to a point that uh, he was not responding his eyes looked past me his uh, body limbs uh, started to turn purple and blue I, I literally thought he died in my arms and you know I think um, I think as parents we had a lot more in common um, than we think um, I want to change uh, our focus uh, a little bit to uh, to parenting. Uh, one of the things uh, why I started what I what I do now, just doing podcasts, writing books, is to spread uh, inspiration. Is to try to build a a global community based on similarities rather than differences. And one of the things that I've noticed in um, in the last two years, in particular, there's a surge of viral messages that are spreading fear and hatred, right? And I personally believe, like you, there's a better way to communicate, which is through love, positivity, and inclusion. I'm just curious uh, to, to learn from you. You know, in the midst of all this chaos, you know, the global pandemic, Black Lives Matter, uh, discrimination, et cetera, et cetera. How, how should someone as parents or as leaders think about handling these difficult conversations to ensure, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a good future for the next generation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that's a really great question, and I think there's so many layers to it. Um, but for me, I think as a parent, I'm I'm just going to really focus on the three P's. I'm going to focus on patience, persistence, and perspective. Um, I know my children are only very young, so they don't get what's going on, which is a, which is a great blessing. But I think that yeah, the patience, persistence, and continual perspective is is critical. For, for kids as uh, coming from a parent a parenting point of view. Uh, I think another thing that is really important is um, we need to be able to go back to the old fashioned ways of drawing a line down the middle of our page. And on the left hand side, we put things that are in our control. And on the right hand side, we put things that are out of our control. You know, we, we can't spend a large majority of our time and energy and effort and emotion focusing on the things that are outside of our control. And I think that's what we do. And that's that really fills us with anxiety and fear. And for me, fear is false evidence appearing real. You know, we can't buy into what is going on in social media and what we perceive is going on around the world because, you know, 95% of it is, is, is not true anyway. But emotionally, we can buy into that. So for me, it's really about ensuring that we focus on the things that are completely in our control. And we need to really equip ourselves with the right tools to emotionally deal with things from a mental strength and toughness point of view. You know, I have a very structured, very disciplined routine every single day that I share with my clients. I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching with different people around the world. And, um, you know, it's activation, meditation, appreciation. I make sure I get exercise in first thing in the morning to get the endorphins hit. And, uh, you know, my kids wake up early, so I wake up earlier. It's always pitch black and freezing cold when I get out and do my thing. Um, I can't be in the general public anymore, so I make sure I get it done before anybody else wakes up. And the meditation stuff, you know, I, I thought for a long time meditation was for, for hippies, you know, for people that drove around in, in vans and, you know, lived, lived in the back of cars. Like I, I didn't realize until I started working with pro athletes earning $30 million a year or working with the top 100 CEOs in the country that's one thing they all had in common. They all they all meditated. They all understood the power of the mind. They all understood silence in the mind. We have, I think we have 80,000 thoughts a day and 70% of them are negative. So if there's a way that we have the ability to do something that slows our mind down. You know, my son was flipping out two days ago. Just, you know, it was, it was over something really, really, really important to like, you know, he wanted a, a blue texture not the red texture or you know something critical like that as a kid you know, it's the worst Personal thing that problem. could happen yeah exactly i don't want to have my milk out of that cup i want to out of that cup you know it was just it was heartbreaking for him but but uh, and i say that all in tongue in cheek obviously but i um i i just said mate we 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 need to start we need to start focusing on our breathing right now we need to slow down so you know i my three-year-old knows how to, in inverted commas, meditate. He knows how to slow things down. And, you know, we, we just do the, you know, four in the nose, four out the mouth, four in the nose, four out the mouth, slow it down, then three in, three out, two in, two out, one in, one out. And it, it's like diffusing what could be an explosive emotional 
turmoil. And, and I think if that works for a three-year-old so quickly when his brain is flipping out, then it can only be doing wonders for us as adults. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing is, is appreciation. And I, you know, I have a gratitude journal um, every single morning, every single night. I text, uh, I think about seven or eight people that I text every morning, the three things that I am truly grateful for because I really believe that, you know, what you speak, you manifest. And if you're constantly talking about the things that you are grateful for, then all of a sudden you will manifest more things in your life that you are grateful for. But not only will you manifest them, you will begin to be acutely aware of them. You will identify them more effectively, more precisely. And I think that has a profound impact on our ability to control our mind, stay optimistic when times get tough and allow us to avoid the world of negativity that is social media right now. So Mike, you gave us a very insightful and useful toolkit uh, that everyone can start practicing, activation, meditation, and appreciation. I wanted to turn our focus to uh, happiness. Um, Pursuit of Happiness, one of my favorite movies from Will Smith. What do you think? Does happiness need to be pursued? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. I think that you need to constantly refine your perspective on life that will allow you to chase happiness and the reason why I think we chase happiness is because we are constantly getting thrown things at us that can very quickly deter us or take us away from the joys of our life. Um, you know, the battles, the struggles, the challenges, the pandemics that occur, th they are the things that deter us and, uh, and very easily allow us to just constantly focus on them. So I think uh, not only, you know, do we chase it, I guess, but in inverted commas, we need to focus on it and strive to identify it and, and ensure we are appreciative of the happiness that is around us. But yeah, I, I absolutely think that it's something that we need to constantly and continually chase. But also we need to understand and define it as well. You know, I think happiness to you may be different to happiness to me. People perceive, you know, like when I'm rich, I'm going to be happy. And then they get rich and realize that they're lonely and they're not happy because in the pursuit of in inverted commas, richness or happiness they've 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 turned the world away from them because they've been so narrow-minded and so shallow focused uh, so i think that you know that that is that's really important that we identify clearly exactly what happiness looks like and feels like and smells like and tastes like you know for me happiness is is about getting out of bed every day and knowing in my heart that i can make a difference in somebody else's life that that makes me happy and I chase that every day. I want to identify ways that I can do that. I want to demonstrate kindness to people as often as I can. Little things, I want to pay for somebody's coffee. I want to push someone's trolley back to the trolley bay. I want to let people in when traffic's trying to cut them off. I want to, you know, do podcasts with people like yourself when, you know, my schedule is busy and I, you know, I could be with my with my wife right now um, but but I choose to be here with you because I only hope that I can make an impact in one person's life that's listening to this and then they domino that effect forward and they start to be a better mum or a better dad or a better friend, better neighbour, better human being. They, they take that risk to serve that extra person, to make a difference and I think that is, you know, that's the, the answer, passionate pursuit of happiness. Thanks. Um, okay, just to wrap up, I wanted to ask you, and I mentioned this throughout our dialogues, I think one of the issues that we've observed, and you've also brought it up, is around social media. Um, we are not short of digital connection. We are more connected than ever digitally, right? Every one of us on average has at least five or six connected devices. So in the internet world, we're connected uh, to one another, you know, um, but on a more human level, on a psychological level, you know, we are less connected uh, with each other. We're less human to one another. What can we do more of as leaders and as parents? And if there's one thing, if there's one thing that you could change about the world, what would that be? Mm, I think as leaders and as parents, what we can do to be able to assist uh, 
us greatly with this ever connected world is you know I, I make sure that I have a, a triple D day at least once a week and that's a digital detox day I make sure that one day a week at least I do not get on social media I do not get on my my Facebook social media Instagram you know uh, LinkedIn I, I give myself and my mind the opportunity to just simply disconnect and stop being so readily available to the world. I think from a from a parenting point of view and a leadership point of view, I think it's critical that we have digital detox days. You know, we we also have um, like on Fridays we have phone free Fridays. We we only make um, uh, we we won't make any outbound calls. We don't we don't text people. We just you know if if it's an important call, we'll answer it. But we make sure that we're not distracted by our phone. And another thing from a parenting point of view, my son has never seen me send an email. My son has never seen me on Facebook. My son has never seen me on social media because I want my son to know that he is the most important person in the world. I, I don't want him to wish that he was in my phone so he could finally get some attention. And I think that is such an important, important message for everybody. You know, the reason why our kids are so glued to their phones is because we are so glued to our phones. They are mirrors of us. And I think, you know, yes, there is a place in the world for technology. There is obviously a place in the world for social media. And that does allow us to connect with people. It's amazing. I I normally would be in America eight or nine times a year and I haven't seen my friends over there since my last trip in November of 2019 and I still feel so connected with them because we speak all the time and we see each other all the time which is a great privilege and a great blessing but it's just about harnessing it and, and understanding it and and to your final question you know uh, around what what would one thing be I would love to change in the world you know obviously i would love harmony i would love peace on earth these are big ticket items that would just be incredible but i think authenticity and humility would be just such a beautiful trait to see in the world right now to have people you know stop focusing on the the negatives and realize that they're you know through a very turmoil very destructive um, very painful time in humanity there are still some really, really beautiful things going on in the world. And I think the more that we can focus on the light, the greater joy that will be brought into our lives. And the greater joy that we have in our lives, the, the greater quality of life that we have. You know, I, someone said to me one day, you've been dealt with some really crappy cards. I remember saying back to them, whilst ever I'm being dealt cards, that means I'm still in the game. It's about how I choose to play those cards that allows me to live a remarkable life. And, you know, I challenge everybody listening today. Don't spend your life comparing your cards to other people. Be grateful. Be grateful that you're still in the game. Be grateful that you still have cards. And do your best to play those cards as effectively and optimistically and as positively as you possibly can. Because as I said earlier, the quality of one's life is not dictated nor is it determined by the amount of days we live on this earth. It's about what we fit into those days. And Right now, it's about making sure we fit in as much as we can so we can enjoy the time that we have whilst we have it because, you know, that's one thing that we guarantee is going to happen. There's going to be a time when our life ends and it's what we do in that dash between the birth date and the death date that really determines the impact that we can have. Mike, truly thank you for joining us today. I, I'm, I'm sure so to the listeners, we have learned so much about everything that you said today, all your remarkable life stories, the way that you see life, and also, you know, amongst all the uh, challenges uh, with the global pandemic and the different suffering that um, each of us might be having every day. I think your perspective uh, and the tools and the toolkits that you have shared with us today is going to help a lot of people to help them overcome adversities, to look at life differently, and hopefully to look at life through more of a glass half full perspective. Thank you again for sharing and coming on to the podcast, Michael. And it's been a lovely chat and uh, hope everything is well with your family and I look forward to catching up with you again. Thank you, Aaron. Take care, everyone. Take care. I hope you enjoyed the chat. I always say our life is very much like discovering what the next chapter is in our own book. And what we do today can change the narrative in the next chapter. Our life, given by nature, is short. 
but it's not the duration that matters. What matters more is how many meaningful things we can do and how many people we can help in our life. I hope you have gotten some inspiration and new ideas about what you can do differently today. And as you are doing it, remember to also change your ecosystem so that you can sustain it. I firmly believe our world will be a much better place if all of us are focusing on becoming a better future self together with the people we love. See you in the next episode.